In this lesson, we'll be talking about another of the long tail content areas that you might find in the GMAT Focus Edition Quantitative Reasoning section, and that's going to be sequences and patterns. So first, we have to just define how sequence notation works. And here you'll see a sequence named S. N is the subscript indicating the term number is equal to N plus 1 over N. So as I said, that S is the sequence title. So that's just the name. The subscript, whether it's n or some number or some other variable, is the term number in that sequence. And then n plus 1 over n in this instance, or whatever is to the right of the equal sign, is going to be your term value. So the way this works is we have to first assume that the term numbers, the n in this case, are only integers greater than 0. So you can't have a negative term number because it wouldn't exist. And you can't have a fractional term number either for the subscript. So for instance, here, term 1, if we plugged 1 in for n as the subscript, and then as the n variable on the right-hand side to determine the term value, term 1 would become n plus 1 or 1 plus 1 over n or 1, and that would become 2 over 1 or 2. Then the second term would be where we would plug 2 in for n, and we'd have 2 plus 1, or 3, over n as 2, and that would equal 3 halves, or 1.5. So there are some special instances of sequences, starting with arithmetic sequences. So an arithmetic sequence is when there's a constant difference between each term in the order of a sequence. So things such as consecutive integers, consecutive odds, consecutive multiples are each going to be arithmetic sequences, because if you're talking about consecutive integers, you have a constant difference of one between each of the terms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a difference of one between each of those integers. Between consecutive odds, you're going to have a difference of two between each of the terms, because we do one, three, five, seven, nine, so on and so forth. And you could even do any multiple as an arithmetic sequence, such as the multiples of five, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, you have a constant difference of five. And there are some implications for when you're looking at an arithmetic sequence. First, we know that the median of the sequence is going to be equal to the average of the sequence. So if we just considered that 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 example, the multiples of 5, we know that 5 plus 10 is 15, 15 plus 15 would be 30, 30 plus 20 would be 50, and 50 plus 25 would be 75. Divide by the number of terms, we get to 75 divided by 5 or 15, which was also the median of that sequence. So if you encounter an arithmetic sequence, some of the information that you may have gleaned from our earlier lesson on statistics can be applicable. Because oftentimes with an arithmetic sequence, you'll be asked to solve for the value of a term, or you'll be asked to solve for the sum of the terms. And you can solve for the value of any term in an arithmetic sequence as long as you know the value of a single term and the constant difference within that sequence using this formula where the sequence a subscript n so any term in sequence a can be found by using the equation of the first term in a because you have to set where it starts plus n minus one meaning the term number minus one times d where d is the constant difference between the terms so if you have any of the terms, you'll be able to solve for any other term, provided that you know the difference between them. Now, a geometric sequence is going to be where you have a constant ratio between the terms. So that is ultimately what you may know as an exponential increase. It's when you multiply something by a constant value. And here you can, again, solve for the value of any term with the value of the first term and the multiplier. And in this case, we'd have the formula a subscript n. So C, the term in sequence a can be solved for by using the equation a subscript n is equal to the first term in a or a subscript 1 times r to the n minus 1 power, where r is the constant ratio between the terms, because you would be multiplying that value by its the constant difference some number of times, and that number of times would be exactly one fewer than the term number itself because you don't multiply it for the first term, but every term after that you would. Okay. Now, the most likely way that you'll 
encounter sequences is actually going to be in pattern recognition. So our quantitative reasoning patterns can be creatively tested, and they're often related to sequences and sets. And they require more logical recognition rather than rote calculation. And as I mentioned before, they can seek sums, averages, or individual terms in a sequence or a set. So strategically, you need to recognize that if you're being asked for a nonspecific value, we first know that that's an indication of a logical evaluation opportunity from all of our tactical pieces. But we also know that it may actually tie into a sequence or pattern recognition if they're asking you for something like what must be, what's the greatest value, what's the least value, what's possible. You also may see things like ranges and approximations. So if you're being asked to find an answer choice that fits within a range, that could be an indication that you're looking more so at a pattern or sequence type of problem. You have to write out all the steps before you begin your calculations to recognize a pattern though. Because if you auto process the arithmetic, you may end up missing out on the possible pattern. And we'll see that here in a moment. And you need to carefully a lot, uh, logically evaluate your information as opposed to worrying more so about finding a common denominator for like 75 fractions. So now that we've got the basics of patterns, let's take a look at how it can manifest itself in an arithmetic sequence so you can see how the recognition piece is going to play out. So Let's start by looking at an example. We've got if the first term of a sequence is one and the nth term is defined as a subscript n, so the nth term of sequence a is equal to one over n minus one minus one over n, what is the sum of the first 50 terms of the sequence? So we start by just writing out the first term and the situation tells us that is one. Then we've got to work through the rest of the terms. So our next term is going to be a, a subscript n would be 2. So we'd have 1 over 2 minus 1 or 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2. And I just write it out like that. I don't want to go, oh, that's a half. Because if you do so, you'll end up having to process all of the common denominators and you ultimately won't recognize the pattern that is going to manifest itself. Our third term, in a similar fashion, just writing it out, we know that 1 over 3 minus 1 is 1 over 2 minus 1 over 3. Then our fourth term is going to be 1 over 3 minus 1 over 4. And this is where visually you might recognize a canceling pattern. Because when we're being asked for the sum, we could see that all of the minuses as the second part of the sequence term structure are going to cancel out with the subsequent terms first part that is the plus. So our minus one half in the second term cancels out with the positive one half in the third term. Our minus one third in the third term cancels out with the positive one third in the fourth term. And this cancellation pattern is going to cancel everything except for the first part of the second term and the very first term except the subtraction term 50. So we know that the 50th term is going to be 1 over 49 minus 1 over 50 using just the structure of the sequence. And we know that everything's going to cancel from that minus 1 fourth to the positive 1 49th, with the exception of the minus 1 50, because we don't get to the next term after 50 to cancel out that negative. So now we just have to sum the, non, the three non-canceled terms. So we've got the first term, which is 1, plus the 1 minus one fiftieth because we had one over one in the second term that didn't cancel out either. And then we just subtract out the one fiftieth at the very end of the pattern. And we can see that we'll have one plus one, which would be two minus one fiftieth. So you could write that as one or uh, 50 over 50 plus 50 over 50 would be 100 over 50 minus one fiftieth, which would be 99 fiftieths. Or if the answer choices are in decimal, you could find it as 1.98. So in order to recognize sequences and patterns, step one, set up the scratch pad for the problem as always, and note the sought value and the format of the choices to inform your problem solving process. Because all the tactics really could be in play here. Step two, you need to carefully read the problem and articulate the sequence. Be very careful of confusing term number for term value, the subscript versus what's on the right hand side of the equal sign. This is something that happens to a lot of test takers. So just be very careful about 
recognizing which is actually your ter term value and which is your ordinal number of term in the sequence. And of course, write your terms fully without immediately calculating so that you can catch those types of patterns. So then step three, you need to consider the best approach for solving. If you can take a technical path, go ahead and do so. It's probably most effective and efficient. But if you can't uh, find a clear technical approach, you can abandon that in favor of logical estimation or potentially modeling back solving in some instances. It's less likely there. But if you recognize efficiencies through pattern recognition, then you can certainly do some logical evaluation, kind of like we did with the example moments ago. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and take a look at an example using our scratch pad so you can see how to execute with these sequence and pattern style questions for the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT focus. Here we have a sample problem solving setup. So we're gonna just list out our answer choices as we always do to start the problem solving process and with a little line over top for what we're being asked for. And since we have simple numbers, we'll write them out. 5, 17, 22, 27, and 37. And if we skip to the end, we can see we're being asked for what is the value of term S sub K. So S sub K is equal to question mark. And we can immediately see that we're being asked to deal with a sequence. So we start reading from the beginning. For sequence S, each term S sub N is equal to S sub N minus one. So the one prior term minus five for all n being greater than two. Then we switch to k is greater than two, and that's just basically saying that k follows the construct of this sequence. So what is the value of term s sub k, what we've already written out as our sought value, when s subscript k plus two is equal to 27? So what we need to do at this point, if we're going to engage with this sequence technically, is just work through the steps following the construct. So we know that the S K plus two term is going to be basically our S sub N. So we'll just plug that in as 27. Now, what term is one term less than the S K plus two term? Well, that's going to be the S K plus one term, because if you take one away from k plus two, as indicated by the subscript in the original sequence notation, you're going to get k plus one. Then we just subtract five. So now if we add five to both sides of this equation, we can solve for the s k plus one term as being equal to 32. But we're not being asked for the s k plus one term. We're being asked for the s k term. So we then just move the s k plus one to the left hand side of the sequence notation. And we know that's going to be equal to the s sub k term minus five. Now we can plug in 32 as the value of the s k plus one term that we just found. And that's going to be equal to the s subscript k minus five as dictated by the sequence. And then we add five to both sides. And we discovered that 37 is going to be equal to the S subscript K term. And that's our answer. And if you're able to work the sequence technically, go ahead and do so. However, this is not the only way that you can work through this sequence. And honestly, there's going to be usually a logical evaluation opportunity for just about all sequence or pattern recognition questions. So let's take a look at our logical evaluation alternative here. So if you're having trouble just kind of tracking the differences between the ends, the Ks, the terms, the values, and all that sort of stuff involving a sequence, just think about it more in a kind of English way. So if we said n were equal to 4, then we just have our fourth term as our S sub n being equal to our S sub N minus one term. So that's going to be our third term. But that third term is going to be subtracting five. So that means we'd have to add five to both sides to put the third term in terms of the fourth term. So we know that the fourth term is going to be equal, or sorry, the fourth term plus five is going to be equal to the third term. And because of that, we know that ultimately, the third term has to be greater than the fourth term. 
So how does this help us? Well, that tells us that every term as we go along is going to actually end up being less than the prior term. So that means that our s k plus 2 term has to be less than the s k term that came before it. So we know that the s k plus 2 term is equal to 27. So that means that my s sub k term has to be greater than 27. And look at our answer choices. Only one answer choice, that same 37, remains bigger than the 27. So if you're able to work through the logic of the sequence, you still might be able to get to the correct answer, even though you don't necessarily work the technical articulation of the algebra. So as you practice sequence and pattern questions on your own, make sure you're looking for alternative tactics in addition to the technical approach in order to make sure that you're flexible on these types of problems when you encounter them in the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus.